Um, so it is my pleasure to welcome you to the second session of today's workshop. And um, we will now have the third speaker of today, which will be David Fischer. He's a postdoc in our lab and he developed together with Fabian and myself the method node-centric expression models. Um, and he will now introduce the theoretical concept um, underlying this method, followed by a live tutorial um, presented by myself. Yes, then I would lead over to David. Thank you, Anna. Can you see the play? Yes. Nice, thanks. Cool, hey everybody. Um, so in the last session, we uh, heard a bunch about the different stuff you can do with Scriptby, uh, which is a lot uh, sort of primary processing of spatial data. Um, and this is now about one subset of data modalities and a specific processing thereof that you can use to learn uh, communication from spatial graphs of cells or more generally dependencies between cells in space. Um, and we call this node-centric expression model. So that's the name for the mathematical framework we use on top of this. And yeah, I spent the next 20 minutes or so introducing you to that. So uh, first of all, um, let's briefly consider what statistical dependencies between sets are because we're gonna use that concept uh, quite a bit throughout the talk now. Um, one way of thinking about them is to think about cellular communication. So think, for example, NicheNet or CellPhoneDB. Um, so here, there's a notion of statistical dependencies between cells and that these tools look for cognate ligand receptor pairs uh, that are either co-expressed and putatively interacting uh, cell populations, so cell types, or uh, where the cognate uh, expression relates to downstream target gene expression. So here the statistical dependency would be, uh, there's something in cell type A that looks as if it's interacting with cell type B and there's something on both sides of both gene expression signatures. Um, now, um, in space, people have looked at special dependencies, for example, in the sense of, finding repeated clusters of cells, so like conserved neighborhoods or something like this. Um, so in this of this case, this can be yeah, a clustering of a color graph, so where setups are categorical. And now we were interested in building um, parametric models that are relatively unbiased of statistical dependencies between cells, so sort of like spinning this idea of uh, how cells interact with each other um, a bit more into the direction of unsupervised learning. Now, um, if you want to do this on non-spatial data, so imagine a single cell RNA seq data set where you have just a unstructured set of cells essentially and the associated gene observations, you run into the problem that it becomes very hard to learn parametric embeddings of these cells or these samples, because essentially what you'd want to do is learn parameters that tell you how cell five relates to cell 10 in the data set. Um, and it's very hard to discriminate how that should look like as opposed to the coupling between cell five and cell 50, for example. So a lot of the parametric stuff um, of learning dependencies in general and gene expression data sets in the single cell realm is about how genes relate to each other. So sort of like you focus on one cell embedded but the next cell into the same space and so on and so on. And this is really not so easy in space. Uh, sorry, um, in, uh, if you look at cell cross cell dependencies. So essentially the core uh, idea that we look at in uh, node centric expression models is that we use spatial graphs to prioritize which cells may be interacting and therefore allow for a parametric models of cell cell dependencies. So that may sound a bit abstract now, but yeah, we'll dig into this now. So just from a motivation point of view, um, we use the graph as a constraint to who can interact with whom, and thereby um, we arrive at a construct that's feasible to do parametric inference on. So first of all, this graph, um, this was mentioned briefly before already. So this is a spatial graph of cells. Every node is a cell, 
and every node is represented by a gene expression vector or some other molecular abundance vector, um, depending on the say that you have. So um, for this, you need a approximately subcellular uh, resolution assay. So that could be MRFish, imaging mass spectrometry, SeqFish, um, antibody-based ones like Codex, and the like. And in these assays, so here, imagine you're here on the left, you have this image which has subcellular resolution. You can segment cells or nuclei, depending on the protocol. And then you can aggregate the information in each channel in each segment. So for example, the easiest operation that would commonly be used would be to take a sum or a mean over each center in each segment. So in practice, this means, uh, imagine you have gene C, which is in your panel of your spatial protocol, um, and you take the mean of um, the gene uh, C occurrences in a Murphy's say, for example, for a segment that's here on the top. And then you know, essentially, gene C had form of its spots, so four molecules in that cell. So this gives you this vector shape representation of every segment, which is then every cell. Now, um, what you would expect to see if you represent cells like this, so where this is sort of what we set out to uh, find or see if we can find it, is um, that spatially proximal cells influence their respective expression states on the level of within cell aberration. So in a very simplistic example, here um, you have a tissue with uh, two cancer cells on the left and on the right. And um, they differ in their proximity to a neighboring immune cell. So here in blue, these immune cells, this cell here doesn't have one directly next to it, whereas this one here does. So what you might expect is that, or yeah, what may happen in some cases is that this immune cell here somehow represses the cancer cell. So there's this direction interaction here. Um, now, if you think about this information on the graph, this means that this cell type here, so this cancer cell doesn't necessarily switch cell type, right? Because that's a somewhat conserved identity, but it would change its gene expression state. And this is explicitly sort of like what we hope to get from these higher resolution assays that we can really like tell apart the finer grain cell states. Now, um, yeah, so in the rest of this talk, I refer to um, this neighborhood as a niche. Um, so we usually uh, consider niches within a, a circle of a particular size, so with a radius that we call resolution. You can imagine, depending on the type of phenomenon you're looking at, this may be bigger or smaller. Um, and uh, to finish off the graph definitions, so on this graph now, um, you have categorical cell types, so like immune epithelia, and like some cancer cell here, um, and the gene expression vectors. Now, the type of model that we set up to reflect the phenomenon that I just described is one um, that tries to learn the contribution that every cell type in a neighborhood has on any other cell type that is the index cell. So here in this case, um, on the lower right, um, we want to learn how the yellow cells one and two behave um, and the presence or absence of the blue cells, which are the immune cells, how the immune cells behave in the presence or absence of the other cells. But here, yeah, so for these, essentially, we saw in the other pictures, we don't really see a strong trend. Um, and similar for the epithelial cells, how they behave depending on the niche. So if we were to fit this model on this type of data set that I showed before, essentially, the key outcome would be that we don't see a trend on blue, we don't see a trend on white, but we do see differential outcomes for yellow. So yellow cell type, cancer cell, becomes uh, repressed if it is proximal to an immune cell, so if the immune cell is present in the niche, whereas uh, it's active if um, there is no immune cells close by.
Now, if you think about this as a linear model, uh, you can imagine there's coefficients for how every sender cell type influences the cell state of a protective receiver cell type. So this exact example here um, could translate into coefficient matrices for every gene where you have strong, so high magnitude coefficients uh, going from immune cells to um, so blue immune cells to yellow cancer cells, which is then exactly like the type of direction interaction uh, you'd want to infer on this tissue. Now, more generally, uh, this type of function class um, is the graph neural network. And yeah, you can think of this um, linear model that I just introduced. So this linear model is essentially one that has interaction terms between receiver and sender identities and enabled. Um, you can think of this as a specific graph kernel that's sort of tailored to the questions that we tend to ask on this type of data. Uh, but in principle, you could think of any other graph kernel that you could plug into here to predict gene expression as a function of local context and cell types and enabled. So think of uh, graph attention. Um, the interaction kernel that we showed is sort of like a max pooling kernel, uh, linear, so GCN convolution. Um, anything that may represent the emergent phenotype that is gene expression in a niche as a function of each context. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I think so the key thing to take away is sort of the structure of the kernel reflects the structure of emergence that you expect to see in the tissue. So yeah, you may imagine that if you have very complex emergent phenotypes that emerge over like sort of like layers of length scales and your data is actually good enough so that you can resolve that, then you may imagine that you might need uh, more nonlinear graph networks. Um, whereas in cases where you have like limited resolution or um, your molecular resolution is only good enough to dissect like two or three cell states per cell type, so subclusters in that sense, um, then maybe um, looking at the linear case here is fine. Now, the first thing we did was to check um, in an ablation study if we find any statistical trace of these effects. And what we did there was essentially to ask, um, so I can predict the gene expression state of a cell based on its type and maybe some image level, so patient level covariates. And now can I get any better if I add the neighborhood to it? So is my prediction gonna be more accurate? This is the y-axis here. So variance explained in the cell. And now the question is, how large of a neighborhood should I choose? What you'd expect sort of that at very small neighborhoods, um, you add very little information because often the neighborhood would be empty um, or um, you don't capture the relevant interactions because you're too strict. Whereas if um, you build these neighborhoods too large, um, you have sort of like chunks of the entire tissue defined as a neighborhood for a cell. Um, and you'd have differential niches that may exist in the tissue just averaging out in that kernel. So what you'd expect to see in this type of evaluation study is if there was any signal um, to have like a wave-like performance structure where um, as you hit the length scale at which the statistical dependency appears biochemically. So like, for example, the length scale of cell communication as mediated by paracrine signaling or say signaling um, by direct membrane contact. So these all appear on like very specific length scales and you'd expect uh, to see a performance bump when you hit that. So uh, we looked at this on six different data sets from different biological systems and different technologies also um, which sort of reflect potentially different um, realms of biochemical mechanisms 
of dependency and also ability of the method to resolve substates. And we see this performance bump in the ablation, like exactly in this shape. So like going up first and then going down again to high values and all of them. So this is essentially um, this trace of the statistical dependency that motivates us to say, uh, we believe there is a signal in this data set and we believe that it makes sense to look into what these statistical dependencies mean with respect to CSI communication. Now, one example for this, um, and there's more in our preprint also. Um, we looked at dependencies of a specific neuron type, here are two, three uh, neurons, um, on proximal cell types in the brain. Um, and here, if you just subcluster this neuron based on the molecular state, so totally forgetting about space, you get subclusters that actually like group in space also. So like you have like sort of like um, finite grade bands uh, in the cortex here. So this is shown here. Um, and these group with other cell types. So here you'd exactly expect uh, a dependency of this type of neuron here, H of three, uh, based on these other proximal cell types, depending on their availability. Um, and this is also what we saw here. And even um, if you look at the performance of the enzymes of the node central expression model compared to a baseline model, um, here um, red means that the special model is shown better to um, gray where it's not. You even see like this proximity to other cell types reflected in this performance here. Now, um, I'm going to talk about one more example in a second, um, which we ran on decriminalizer data. So this is not the preprinted, um, but it's yeah, it's a very similar concept. We essentially just um, extended the mathematical description of cells on a spatial graph that's defined by nodes that are segments um, to deconvoluted spot transcriptomics where you estimate the, um, the proportion or the abundance of each cell type in each spot. So these cell types in a spot are sort of like also nodes, but you don't have any more structure there. So we assume that they're all neighboring um, and you estimate their respective spot specific gene expression vectors. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, just talk to us, but this um, is relatively easy to set up in the Ensign framework also. And um, then, yeah, we run similar analysis to the ones that I showed before also in this setting here. So here we are looking at a lymph node data set that was deconvoluted with set allocation. And then here also we use the set allocation fits. Um, so here again, um, this is not resolved in the spatial ablation now. Here I just show the best spatial fit compared to a non-spatial baseline. Um, and we get like really strong, actually much stronger than for the single cell data sets, uh, spatial effects here. Um, so delta R squared of, yeah, more than open one uh, over the entire data set. And then also like pretty significantly for every cell type. So these are all the cell types that this was decommoluted to. And here always uh, spatial model in yellow and then corresponding on spatial model in blue. So um, thinking again about whether or not it makes sense to interpret this for spatial dependencies, it, it does because um, the effects are so strong. Um, now, if you fit a linear sum to this, uh, think back of the uh, square effect matrix with the immune to cancer cell uh, effect before. Um, so we can do this here between all of the cell types and look at the uh, the strength of interaction between each pair of cell types, for example, by looking at the number of differentially expressed genes. So in the case of linear and some, you can do wall testing, which is vanilla differential expression testing to do um, model selection. And yeah, so you can use the number of differentially expressed genes for a pair sort of as an indicator of how much they're interacting. Um, but also you can um, use the uh, a one norm or a two norm of the significant coefficients that you want to have uh, a bit more of a quantitative view of like 
how much each of these genes actually contribute to the differential states. Um, so overall, this will give you one scalar that tells you how much every cell affects every other cell. So it's a cell type type cell type matrix, uh, which we visualized here, um, only showing sort of like the major edges. Um, and um, yeah, so in this case, we zeroed in a bit on this triangle of cells. There must be cells and for the keratinic cells. And uh, so we found that these reflect germinal centers in this data set. So here we really see sort of like the niche trace of germinal centers in uh, the expression states of these cells by looking at these couplings. Um, so these are like particular cell states of these specific three cell types are rich in these centers, and therefore you get these couplings. Um, yeah, so we call these couplings or type couplings. Um, yeah, I think they're, they're sort of nice to look at the several stuff. They're also directional, so you get an effect uh, from B cell to genetic cell and reverse, or only from B cell to mouse cell. Um, and yeah, this can reflect like very specific effects on that tissue. Um, then you can compare uh, how different sender cell types affect one receiver cell type on the gene expression level. So sort of like, uh, if you think about this circular plot that I just showed, uh, blowing up one series of errors that uh, converge on one receiver cell type and sort of like um, focusing on the effects of these senders on specific genes. Uh, similarly, you can also do it reverse, like looking for one sender, how that sender affects specific genes expression and different receivers. Um, and then lastly, yeah, you can also for individual interaction, you could look at something like a volcano plot. So if you are at a specific pair, let's say you look at the effect of uh, B cell on the dritic cell, um, then you're essentially looking at the result of a gene, uh, differential expression test over all genes. So you have uh, one differential expression outcome for every gene at this point. So then um, you can do standard different expression stuff like volcano plots. And then lastly, um, again, as a sort of like summary for you to like interact with these fits because they're pretty rich in data, um, you could look at how um, the transcriptomic effect of different senders to one specific receiver relates to each other. So is the overall effect of CD4 and CD8 T cells on, um, I think you were showing B cells, um, similar to each other, or is it more similar, are they more similar with respect to each other than they are similar to monocytes? Um, and here in this analysis, we saw that uh, a bunch of sort of like T leaning sites here, a very similar effect on B sites, which is again, sort of like, um, like a sanity check somewhat that um, you find the cell ontology signal here conserved in the sender signatures that they have. Um, yeah, so that's also because it's like across genes, it's a, it's a very good like overall summary of it. So. And lastly, really briefly, um, we also looked at incorporating um, the it's a specific ligand receptor signaling axes into the model. That's again, an extension, if you want, of um, this concept that I presented. Um, so here, you wouldn't have cell types in the input anymore, but you'd embed the receptor expression on an index cell with the cognate ligand expressions on neighboring cells. Um, and then you would get uh, like a sort of like a receptor activity latent space from which you then reconstruct. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, Again, um, talk to us um, just to say the cell type kernel that we base a lot of the stuff on that we present here. Um, yeah, it's a very nice tool to extract uh, interactions um, sort of stratified by cell types, but you can think of more kernels that may be interesting. Yeah. Um, um, brief. So, sort of like performance analysis to show you that this works. 
Um, so here for this kernel, um, we looked at a data set uh, where we imputed uh, MEFISH data with things like RNA seq data so that we would have enough ligand receptor observations. Um, then on this imputed data, so having the full gene expression vector on every node, so we use tangram for this imputation. Um, we fit a linear uh, answer. Um, then we fit uh, a standard nonlinear one. So both of these take the categorical setup as an input. Um, and then we fit um, this adjusted ligand receptor kernel, um, which then yields yeah, much higher uh, reconstruction performance um, because it has a much more complex input space. Um, yeah, so there's essentially like a bunch of priority you may be able to represent with these things here. Um, but uh, yeah, um, the set type stuff is a bit more constrained. So I think, yeah, there's like advantages to both of them. Like for sure, the set type stuff is easier to interpret, I think. Yeah, and that's it. Um, yeah, so um, thanks, Anna, also, who's going to run the tutorial now. If you're interested, and the individual benchmarks, you can read our manuscript on BioArchive or look at our GitHub repo. Um, yeah, and then there's a bunch of links to script by in the code to like deal with the graphs and stuff. Um, yeah, and then lastly, um, tomorrow also you will hear about certification. So it's tool to do the spatial deconvolution, um, which I showed you here in the second half, like. You can incorporate here to then dissect uh, CSA interactions also. Nice. I can't see the chat. Yes, but I, I can. We have two questions on the slide, or maybe we can address these first before we move on. So the first one is in the motor cortex data set, can you repeat how the relative performance is calculated? Yeah, I go back to that slide. So the relative performance here is the same relative performance that we also show here. So, okay, here we show absolute performance and then here on the side, we show the baseline model. So here relative performance would be difference between peak performance here and this relative, and this baseline model. Um, here now, so this is aggregate, right? So every line here is a cross validation. Um, and then this point here is the total performance over all cells. Um, here now we break this down to every single cell. So uh, for this cell over here, um, we have an observed gene expression vector. Then we have a predicted vector that comes from a baseline model. And we have a predicted vector that comes from an n cell model. Um, if this is very red, um, it means that the uh, spatial model, so the n um is much closer to the observed expression vector than the baseline model. Whereas if it's like heavily blue, just like the case for like a few here and a few here, there the baseline model is better. But yeah, so if like if you average this, um, the so across all cells, the NCM has better performance. Um, and what's sort of nice to see is that um, you can so if you aggregate this over all sets, right, you'll have something like a box plot or like even only a point that like uh, reflects the mean of that box plot. Um, but if you look at this here, you see that the stronger performance really comes from essentially specific niches, right? Like here, this is a niche because here is like a very specific local set of composition. Um, and here you really can leverage the special context uh, for gene expression prediction. Same here. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's a way sort of like of blowing up this one distribution over space to like vision interpret this. If you can roughly tell where the niches are, right? Because like in cortex, like the niches are sort of partially uh, structured. Um, in other tissues, this is also the case, but sometimes it may be not so visually accessible uh, because maybe they're like too small or something, then, then maybe it doesn't make so much sense to look at this. Okay, next question would be, I did not understand why this is implemented as a neural network. Yeah, um, 
So this um, is a linear model, right for every gene, you can fit these effects. Um, and uh, below here, this here, uh, this also resides uh, that derived from this linear model. It's a very specific linear model in that the design matrix comes um, from a neighborhood defined for a particular resolution, so particular neighborhood size. And then the coefficients have, so they indicate the identity of the index cell and the presence of other cell types in that neighborhood. Um, so it turns out that you can also frame this as a graph kernel, that is a graph neural network. So in the most general things, all of this are neural networks. Um, but there's a specific one that is a linear model that's also useful to look at this data. Um, yeah, we like to think of this more generally as neural networks because, I mean, so this specific graph kernel, right? Like it's nice for interpretation, but um, because it essentially only parameterizes interactions between an index uh, and receivers, um, it cannot easily reflect higher order niche structures. So for example, like three cell types coming together or something like this. And this is, yeah, in general, like if you look at higher order or like maybe also like strong you nonlinear know, interactions, um, like at some point you will struggle to represent that with um, even like sort of like well framed linear models. Um, and then often you're better off with more flexible graph kernels. So then if you think of this all being part of like a family of graph neural networks, um, these more complex cases, you may be able to represent better with also more complex graph kernels or like deeper graph networks then. But yeah, so think of this, like all of this is graph neural networks, even like the linear one. Um, the linear one is for sure like a good first shot to look at data. But so if I guess the data of these technologies improves and like as the questions that people ask become harder, like it may well be that people move to other kernels than in the future. Yes, and maybe to the next slide, the next question. So um, the best performing models were all around this 10 micrometer. Um, and the question was how much this is dependent on the technology underlying the data. Yeah. Um, so we put this uh, green line at 10 micrometers here as a very rough reference of uh, what a cell radius or a cell size may be. Um, so this really depends on the tissue, right? Like if you're in a lymph node, like on average cells are going to be much smaller than in non liver, for example. Uh, but, you know, like roughly there you have that. And what you'd expect is um, for the uh, performance peak um, to come, let's say, starting at the cell radius and then later, depending on this is uh, if like you have like nuclear segmentation, because then, yes, yeah, sorry, this is cell segmentation, peak. depending on like if you have a more like membrane contract or more like paracrine signaling. Um, we didn't see, so that's the biological context, right? Um, we didn't see a strong technology effect on this, but also I don't think that we have enough data to really look into this, right? Because here, um, it's not like we have the same biological system screened with six different technologies, but we have like the confounding of um, separate systems with different niche biology plus different technologies. Um, yeah. And I think at this point, because yeah, so because um, it's still relatively early days for the cell resolve technologies. Um, this comes down a lot to the performance, comes down a lot to the ability to identify subclusters or like sub cell states. Um, and this is dependent on like the number of markers you have, if you have a panel or depth, maybe if you're looking at Murfish. Yes. Um, maybe in the next one, can we learn cell clusters from the receptor activity graph kernel approach? Uh, can we learn cell clusters? Yes, on the on the ligand receptor model, I assume. Yeah. Um, I wonder what the notion of cell clusters is here. Um, let's see if the response comes. Um, 
So, so the, there's one notion of cell cluster that's, that's essentially a cell type, right? Um, um, this is something that will reflect here because you also need this representation to be able to uh, um, decompress the, so decode the latent embedding. Um, so for sure, this would be there. Um, I guess there's other notion of cell clusters that are like the niche. Um, so maybe like spe specific like niche stereotypes, so cell clusters in space. So those would be there in the sense that the latent space here ideally reflects receptor activity, right? It reflects the ligand being there coming together with, sorry, the receptor being there in the index cell coming together with lignant being present in the neighborhood. So in a way, that's a spatial assembly of cells, right? But detached from set up definitions for now. Um, so this will also be encoded in um, the latent space. So in principle, you could try cluster there and see if you find niches, but because it's superimposed on the cell type signal, maybe it doesn't come out so clean. Um, yeah, but you could for sure imagine to build kernels into that direction. Then maybe one more, one question I would like to address with the tutorial then, but the next one maybe any advice on combining the different cohorts, so cellular, subcellular, and spot level to perform a resolution agnostic analysis. Okay, I'm gonna respond to that only with respect to Ansem because I guess there's a ton of angles to this. Um, we haven't done that, but I would, um, I wonder what the cellular one here is, if it's still spatial. So, cause like the typical setting, I guess would be, you may have like Murphish and uh, Vizium or something like this. Um, and for now, I think I'd run Ansem and parallel on deconvoluted spot transcriptomics and on the single cell one, and then sort of like see, um, which effects you find in both and maybe use that as a validation. Yeah. Um, great. And the last question, we can also answer this with the tutorial now, which perfectly matches into this, was how many samples do we need to train and test the graph neural network model and derive um, reliable results? And um, this actually, um, so maybe I can share now, because the tutorial we are showing is on one of the data sets um, we also um, tried in the, um, share this one. Yes, one of the, tut um, the data sets we also had in the manuscript, which is the Mibitov cancer data set. And the tutorial I'm showing um, is tailored to a typical analysis you would want to try with NSEM and to obtain some results on cell cell interactions and putative sender receiver dependencies that you obtain in your data set. So, the question is, you don't need so many samples. So in theory, you can run this on a single slide, but um, to run, especially these ablation studies David showed, it's better to have a larger data set because then you get really a notion on the interactions you can find from the data sets and the tissue you're analyzing. Um, but in general, we can also run it on a subsection of slides um, in the tissue. So. I'm running this now in the tutorial on a SquidPy dataset, which you can also um, obtain from the documentation in SquidPy, and you are free to replace this with any spatial dataset. And I will tell you which things are important so you can actually run and some. So I'm first importing now some, some packages that are needed to run and some. For example, one would be ScanPy and SquidPy, of course, and then some plotting functions. This tutorial now is running on the interaction model David explained. So we will have, let me go here. We will have a graph neural network that is taking the categorical cell type classes and tries to learn this continuous space of gene expression. And from this, we can then get the cell type pairings and um, in case of the parameters. So let's look into this. We designed a custom data loader for this. So you can 
feed any end data object into the network and try it on the data. As I said, we are using the SquidPy data set on MeBTOF Cancer. And let's look into this. This would look like this. So there are, sub, there are several um, observations stored with this end data object. One would be the, the point ID, the cell ID, then also some donor information, cluster information, which is crucial to run NSEM, then some library ID, and then some additional variables um, on the features, some unstructured um, observations, so typical ScanPy um, workflow. Additionally, we, which is really crucial because we are looking to spatial transcriptomic data here, the spatial key, and then already um, calculated connectivities and distances. If those haven't been calculated yet, you could just simply call SquidPy directly on your data set and extract the connectivities and distances from it. So as I said, NSIM requires you to have some cluster information. This is present for this example. So we have um, CD4 T cells, epithelial cells, other immune cells, CD8 T cells, T cells, and some other cells. And this is really important because we require the notion of a cell type per se in the data set. So we will run this only on annotated data sets for now, at least in this interaction model. As I said, this tutorial will now uh, work on the interaction model. So we are trying to get a notion on how important a certain sender receiver interactions in the data set. And we will run this now for a given radius. So in this case, we assume that we know cells in a biological system of a collateral cancer communicate as a distance of 20 micrometers. The coordinates here for the pig is given in pixels. So this is why you have here the radius of 52 instead of 20, but this is also explained in the tutorial um, if you need more information on this. If you don't have an idea on the radius that is perfect for the communication patterns in your data set, then one would need to run this ablation study to find this best communication distance of the cell types present in the data set. But sometimes you already have an idea on how these cells present in the data set would communicate. And then we can, you can also run this tutorial and we'll see if the cell types present may communicate and um, what are the dependencies present. So like I said, we can run this now on this end data object and we just define the cluster. We might additionally define the donor. So let's look into ops. So as we see here, there is some donor information present in the data set as well, as well as some um, library ID information. So the actual image where the sample was coming from. In this particular example from SquidPy, they subsetted the original data set to three images. And uh, you will see in a minute that we still find important interactions from these three images that are also valuable and reliable um, as information to the analyst. So we pass this now, and you will see that we now loaded the data set into an NSEM object, and we see some um, information on the data set um, that might be interesting for the analyst. So we loaded three images from two patients across 3,309 cells, and the data set consisted of 36 cell features. So that's our gene expression space, and we have eight distinct cell types. We also, for um, training purposes, split the data set into a um, test, training, and validation data set. This really is important if you have no notion about the communication resolution you want to analyze then um, we automatically set this training data set because you want to uh, find convergence of the neural network. But for this case where you just run it on a perfect distance or a distance you would like to analyze, there you, it will run on the complete data set to find really the interactions that drive this um, gene expression state in the data. 
One may also look into um, the node degree. So if you look into this as a graph neural network and a graph consisting of um, cell types, then it might be interesting what's your mean node degree. So the mean number of neighbors you have. And we see that for this distance around 50 pixels, each node has approximately 10 neighbors. And this makes sense um, also from a biological perspective that only the closest distance within a certain range um, drive your own state, your receiving cell state. The next thing you might be interested in um, is the variance decomposition of your data set. So um, we say in Ensem that we try to model gene expression um, variance. So um, variance that comes just from the spatial neighborhood you have in your data set. And for this purpose, you need to check if there is even variance that is intracell type related. So you can have intracell type variance. So variance is, that is coming from within a particular cell type. You can have intercell type variance. So variance explained that is related between cell types or also gene variance. Here, um, the important thing to note is that the data set we obtained from SquidPy is already pre-processed. So th there might be a shift in the actual variance. So if you look into our preprint, you will see that the original variance of an unnormalized, of this unnormalized data set was um, for an intracell type variance around 20%. So there's still 20% of variance in a particular cell type that was not explained by just this categorical label. And we try with Ensem to explain this remaining 20% of variance within a cell type. For this case here, we might then also want to calculate the mean across different images and different library IDs. And we see here after normalization, it's at 65%. Um, which is reasonable due to the pre-processing steps in this data set. The next natural state would be to check, okay, which cell type variants, um, can we relate these, this variance to some spatial pattern in the data set? And for this analysis, we typically pick one cell type. I do this here now for the example of CD8 T cells. And I would compute spatial dependent substates of T cells and try if I can relate them to specific neighborhood structures that might be plausible for certain dependencies in the data set. So we see if we do basic um, scan pipe plotting and calculation of um, a UMAP that we find five different and distinct substates of CD8 T cells. And now I would like to check with SquidPy if they show some spatial structure. So, and interestingly here now, um, there is a substate of CD8 T cells, the green one, so um, state one, that seems to be scattered more around epithelial cells. And the important thing to note here is that we're looking into a cancer data set, a collectoral cancer data set. So these epithelial cells are um, in fact cancer cells. And we see that the green subcluster is more located around the tumor, tumor region in the data set, whereas the dark blue one seems to be located further away from these cancer cells. And we believe that this analysis, having it in a quick and efficient manner will, um, is really valuable for the analyst to analyze these sender receiver interactions. Everything I showed up until now is purely done on the input data. We haven't fitted a neural network yet, um, but this will come in a minute. So now we want to, what we see here with the green um, cluster being more scattered around the tumor, we would like to quantify this. And for this purpose, we have um, created this function, cluster enrichment, that will calculate and plot the enrichment scores that a certain cluster is um, closer to 
a substrate of CD8 T cells. And we also find that epithelial cells, so um, CD8 T cells one, there's a positive effect on the substrate um, if epithelial cells are close by. We calculate this using a Fisher extract test. So if you have more questions on how we can extract these values, feel free to approach me or David um, on Zulip or the tomorrow. And this is um, really important that you can find some, some concepts within spatial data that proves that you have substates that depend on sending populations. I just want to visualize here the a second cluster, which shows really here some um, most the most significant differences if an other immune cell is close to the CD8 um, T cell zero or one. And let's look into this just to show you another example. We see a similar pattern here that um, cluster zero of CD8 T cells, so the dark blue one. Um, is located closer to um, other immune cells, whereas this cluster one um, is further away from other immune cells. So this now, up until this point, you can do um, with ENSEM just on the input data, and it already provides you some valuable um, insights into substates of um, cell, um, cell types in the data set. And now we really want to fit the node-centric expression model and get these effects that David also showed in the presentation. And we can do this now on the three images um, I just shown. And that's now the important part because we also did this analysis on the complete data set and we extracted similar dependencies. Of course, it depends on the images and if, the, if there's an interaction not present in one of these three images, then you won't see it now in the sender receiver effects. But if you select your images wisely, or for example, if you only would like to see the effects present in one particular image, you can also run the sender receiver effects on a single image. And now the same figure David just showed, we can see these type coupling, um, type type couplings in the data set. And this is now unfiltered, so it looks rather crowded and that all cells are interacting. But um, usually one would say, okay, we have 36 genes in the data set and I would only like to visualize um, these the interactions that have a certain threshold with respect to differentially expressed genes. So the most important interactions in the data set. And I'm doing this here and I'm visualizing now the interacting cell types based on our type coupling analysis. And I, as I said earlier, we are looking in this data set into collateral cancer. So I'm in particular interested into the interaction between CD8 T cell and epithelial cells, which is cancer cells in this data set. And we inspect the enzyme correctly identifies that there is an interaction, an important interaction between these two cell types and that the presence of an epithelial cell close to a CD8 T cell is influencing the gene expression space of a CD8 T cell. We can now also um, visualize this in terms of the pure number of differentially expressed genes. Before I was showing here the magnitude. So for us, this is the L norm, L1 norm of the coefficient, whereas this is the pure fraction of differentially expressed genes. And we see it, um, in a similar fashion that epithelial cells are a important sending cell type for CD8 T cells. So now this gives you the overall picture in your data set of which cell types might be interacting in the data set you're analyzing. But one might also be interesting, okay, which, what is the gene effect I have um, on this interaction axis? So we're looking here now into sending cell types of epithelial cells and receiving cell types CD8 T cells. And we will get within, and some within from seconds, um, 
the mean expression, the p-value, the FTR corrected p-value, as well as the um, fold change of all genes present in the data set. So you really have a notion on how important is a specific gene for this dependency in the data set. And I now would only like to visualize um, a gene subset, which is significant. So which has a um, FDR corrected p-value below 5%. And now we can look into the same figure um, David was showing before. So the sender effect. So we are interested in the receiving cell type CD8 T cell, and we want to know who is the main driver in this genes um, as a sending cell type. And I'm picking here the axis of epithelial cells and CD8 T cells. And we see that really the log fold change of certain genes um, is higher compared to other genes. And interestingly, these genes also play a role in T cell activation. And they also make from a biological perspective really sense that um, there is an effect if you have an epithelial cell close to the CD8 T cell. We can look into the same analysis the other way around by looking at the sending cell type of epithelial cells. And we see that there is also an effect um, on CD8 T cells um, for the sender of epithelial cells. So this whole analysis gives you a new view on the importance of specific genes for sender-receiver interactions. And you can run this um, also on the complete data set within, within seconds in this linear network case. This now also follows closely to what David described that sometimes you would just like to visualize the axis you just identified by running NSEM as a volcano plot which is a typical plot you would run in single cell analysis. And um, we can do this as well by setting thresholds and only visualizing cells and not cells, but genes that are really drivers for these sender receiver interactions. And then lastly, also the figure David showed as one of the last figures is the sender similarity analysis. One interesting finding that also comes now into play, coming back to the question raised earlier, if you can find um, similar interactions, if you reduce the number of cells in your data set, yes, you can, but it's also um, limited. So um, we see here, if we set a receiver to other immune cells that T cells, CD4 and CD8 T cells, have a similar sender profile. But um, if we set this um, to epithelial cells now, it lo will look a little bit different. Um, as you can see that here, there's a difference in the sender profile of CD8 T um, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. But this is, we did the same analysis on the complete data set and there, T cells had a similar sender profile. So it really depends on what you're trying to analyze. We recommend to run the sender similarity on all images because um, it's a proof of concept for us that you can still get the sender cell profile from NSEM. But if you have, if you just are interested in the interactions you have in one particular image, for example, in an image up here that you would like to see, oh, there's a dependency here between CD8 T cells and epithelial cells, then of course you can run NSEM and especially the type coupling analysis on a single image, but it might not give you the global picture of the um, dependencies you have present in your data set. Yes. That's how you would now include this in your analysis if you have an end data object present. But as I said, for the analysis I just showed, you need to have an idea on the interaction resolution you might, might have in the biological system you're analyzing. Um, so if you don't have any idea or clue how they 
interact or if there is even an interaction schema in the data set, we recommend people to run first this ablation study. And we can now also run the ablation study on any A data object. And um, we typically recommend to run this on the GPU because you can then just test multiple resolutions at different radii and just place them on your GPU overnight. And then you will have this ablation study, which also David showed. I'm doing this here just for um, completeness to show how you would be able to call NSEM and actually train NSEM on, on, the, um, on the data set and then get a notion on the radius. So we again call this MIBITOF cancer data set and we will now not call the interpreter to get these type couplings, but we will call the trainer, the actually training of the model. I'm setting here the argument log transform to false because the data set we are looking into is already pre-processed. So the noise structure is already sufficient to, so NSEM can be trained. Um, usually what you would do, we also have some more information on this in our GitHub repository, you would analyze the noise structure present in your data set. And depending um, if you see noise in the, um, in the noise structure, you would then set the log transform to true. But as this is pre-processed, we can um, set it to false. More information, as I said, can be found in our repository. Now I'm again calling the custom loader and um, get my custom data set. And this time we can inspect that we train on 2,695 cells, we test on 330, and the remaining cells will be used as validation. Now I want to actually inspect and initialize my model. So we will use 10 nodes in each forward path through the network, and we will now initialize our model. And you can see the model summary displayed below. We actually have now this dense linear layer with 2,628 parameters learned um, from these interactions in the data set. Interactions because we parameterize the target cell type with the sender cell type. So you will have eight times eight possible interactions in your input formed by this graph neural network. So now we will actually train this. I set here the number of epochs to 10 just to show how this will work. You could actually, because it's quite efficiently implemented, run it now completely in the notebook. I will not do this in, at this time now for the sake of time, but um, feel free to test this at home. So we see here um, several metrics evaluated. And in the end, the way NSEM is designed, you will have the final evaluation of the model stored on disk on your device by calling NSEM. And you can then extract the performance of the network at different um, resolutions, like David showed. And I'm visualizing here this now, because we actually did this for the MIBITOF cancer data set on all images. And you will then see the peak shape I dearly if you have interactions at a certain radius. So after running this for uh, several resolutions, you then see the peak at, for example, here around 20 micrometers, and you would then know, okay, my interactions in the network um, seem to be present at a distance of 20 micrometers. And then again, you could go back to the other tutorial and run the type coupling analysis on the distance you just proved to um, be correct in terms of sender receiver interactions and really extract the putative sender and receiver dependencies. Yes, and that's um, the exemplary tutorial we would have for Ensem. Perfect. Okay, let me look into questions. I have them open. Um, Okay, how many samples do we, um, that was the question we had before. So how many samples we actually need to train the graph neural network? 
And um, as I said, you can in theory run it also on a, just a single image. We did this also for the cell to location example where we deconvoluted a single slide with cell to location, which worked um, extremely well. And then we used this one slide. But if you have a um, MIBITOF of cancer data set or an IMC data set, we think it's beneficial to run it on the complete data set because then you just get a feeling of what are important interactions present in the data set. And yes, or one could also think I'm just run it now on my disease samples because I want to inspect the disease state and then I run it on the healthy state and then you can compare the interactions that um, are present in the disease case and then the uh, healthy state. So that's uh, um, potential options for running this analysis. Um, yes, so the normalization applied to the Mibitov cancer data set, which is the next question. Um, it was the same pre-processing applied by the um, original office. So it's a paper published by Hartmann et al. Um, I think it's two years old or something. And I think they applied standard, um, standard ScanPy. So that's the paper um, we are using here and we are addressing. And they applied, I think, standard ScanPy pre-processing. And I can also publish the paper to this data set in the Zulip later on. Does NSIM support further comparison between conditions? Um, so example given healthy versus disease. So we, I can show you this. So as I said, you can, in NSIM, you can additionally have um, this notion of a donor or this notion of a library ID and feed it into NSIM. This will then be additionally used in the, in the linear model or the nonlinear one. And by passing this, NSIM will transfer to also a vector representation and you can feed healthy or disease within the network. So in this case, I think the three images that were taken are all diseased, but if you look into the original publication, let me show it to you here. Here, so they also have healthy um, samples in the data set, and we use actually both. And by passing this additional covariate of the image or the patient, you can actually feed the condition into NSEM. But then, as I said, for NSEM, we look into these global um, interaction schemas you can identify. I would potentially, if you really want to compare conditions, run it first on the disease state and then on the healthy state. And before that, run the ablation study in, on the complete data set, because then you get this average interaction resolution, and then you can run the um, type coupling analysis on first the healthy and then on the diseased cases, and then plot the circular plots on A, disease, and B, healthy state. And then you could interpret differences that you find with this network. Okay, I think I see more questions in the chat. Yeah, I think that was the answer to the pre-processing. Are there more questions? Okay, I take this as a no, then I would like to thank everyone, especially Fabian, Giovanni um, and David for a nice first day of the workshop and um, feel free to approach us on Zulip we will also keep the Slido open for until tomorrow. So just dump us questions if you have issues installing anything or questions to the methods underlying it. Um, and looking forward to see each of you again tomorrow for the second day of this workshop with Alma and Vitaly on eggplant and salt location and an amazing closing speaker with Johanna Klukhammer. <laughs>